This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Let me um, jump right into it and introduce this uh, very timely, uh, important panel. So in the following order, which is not the order in which they're seated, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Gary Gates, who's the Williams uh, Institute Distinguished Scholar, uh, who folks may know has been much in the news recently for his, uh, his recent refinement based on um, demographic analysis of uh, Kinsey's estimates of exactly how many of us there are. Uh, lots of people are buzzing about that. Um, next to me is Professor Ann Peplau, uh, Professor of Psychology here at UCLA and Director of the Interdisciplinary Research Science Program. And her comments today will draw not just on her research, but her uh, experiences as an expert witness in the uh, Prop 8, the Perry trial of last year. Uh, and folks who have read the, uh, the district court decision, Judge Walker's decision, will notice that uh, he drew extensively upon her work and uh, included many findings based on her testimony. Um, and in that regard, I should also mention uh, that Lee and uh, Dr. Greg Herrick, who presented yesterday, also were uh, experts in that trial. And folks who, who are interested, I would encourage you to read, actually, the transcripts of their testimony, which is um, incredibly interesting. And, and all that work was referenced in the decision. Um, and, and I should mention also that both Lee and Greg were experts in the uh, Barnum case, the Iowa marriage. Uh, trial, which similarly developed ex an extensive evidentiary record, which influenced the decision quite a lot. Next to Professor Peplau, we have Professor Mignon Moore, who is an assistant professor of sociology here at UCLA and on the faculty advisory committee of the institute. And uh, she's doing some very important groundbreaking research regarding a range of things, including in particular relationship and family patterns among African American lesbians. So she'll be talking about that some. Uh, and then we have uh, um, Professor Wendy Manning, uh, who is a professor of sociology at Bowling Green State University, where she's director of the Center for Family and Demographic Research. And next to Wendy, we have Professor Andy Cherlin, who is the uh, Benjamin H. Griswold Professor of Sociology and Public Policy at the Johns Hopkins University. Both of them are leading national experts in the sociology of family relationships who can put uh, all of these comments in bigger context. You know, we shouldn't, most of us think, you know, we shouldn't have to prove our equal personhood to have courts vindicate our constitutional rights. Uh, but the reality is there are myths and misconceptions about gay people. Courts sometimes are worried about whether uh, enforcing the Constitution would cause some of the harmful effects that are claimed by opponents of LGBT equality, whether it would de destabilize the institution of marriage and cause harmful effects for children. Um, and so having top quality research that looks at these questions and proves why enforcing the Constitution is both legally correct and appropriate uh, in terms of the lives of people and, and structure of society, it can be very persuasive and as a sort of reality check, sometimes it provides courts not just with um, information they need, but cover and support that they appreciate when they want to do and recognize how to do the right thing. Um, we are in a very different position today than we were 15 years ago when the first marriage trial was done by uh, Evan Wolfson, who's here somewhere, who um, put on um, expert witnesses, including the testimony of Dr. Char Charlotte Patterson, who's over here, um, where the the case looked at many of the same issues that we're still dealing with today about whether marriage equality would be harmful for kids. And the trial court made extensive factual findings. They're on your memory stick. It's interesting to compare that uh, those factual findings with the findings that Judge Walker made. Um, the reality is there's a lot more research data today, but it comes to the same important conclusions as the conclusions that were reached 15 years ago. And there remain important things to look at. Many times we suspect, because we know from our lives what the research might conclude, 
But the research needs to be done, and we need to find out if our suppositions are right or not, and prove it, and then see what next questions might be uh, indicated by the research as it gets done. So with that, I'd like to um, ask Gary Gates to, to begin. Um, and as we go along, you know, as you have questions, please make notes for yourself, and we'll uh, try to have time for good discussion after we hear from our experts. Gary? Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to use my comments to talk a little bit about some perspectives, I think, around issues that I've been really involved with lately, which is data collection issues and also kind of developing young scholars and, and, how, um, and, and how sort of the system within the academy um, interacts with that in ways that perhaps make it really difficult to get LGBT family and marriage scholarship into kind of the mainstream um, of, of literature. And I think that one of the perspectives I would say about that is that I think that, you know, we have this, I think Americans have this image of academics as kind of, you know, latte drinking Obama voting NPR listeners. And this kind of perspective of this liberal set within the, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but the truth, I think, particularly, I think, within the social sciences is that, that the academy in many ways is actually a very conservative environment around research. I think that the peer review process and the tenure uh, process in the academy foster a, a, a system that um, makes taking academic risks very risky, um, that it, it it, it risks your career, literally, um, if you push the boundaries of, you know, it, it, within disciplines, there's a clear set of kind of canonical, uh, both personages and theories that if you take them on, you do so with great risk, or at least you do so with great risk while you're trying to get tenure. And so when you're kind of a young scholar. And I think that that system, coupled with a peer review system that also, in some ways, kind of is designed to uh, foster, it's not always designed to reward lots and lots of innovation, um, I think. I mean, clearly, in some, it, it does at some point, because things move along. But it's a very kind of incremental process um, that, that that fosters. And so I think the way that plays out in LGBT world is that, that it's, it's risky. Um, or, or it's at least perceived as risky. And the, the academicians who are advising students suggest to them this is a risky idea to, to pursue this type of work. And, and the students are given lots of signals in, in other ways that, that this can be challenging. So then how does that play out with data? Well, you know, I've been doing a lot of work uh, meeting with survey administrators in DC, challenging them to ask, you know, why um, you're not asking questions to measure sexual orientation and gender identity. And one of the most common answers I get is, well, no one's really asking for this. That, you know, it's, and, and the only ones who are, are, you know, people like you, these, you know, gay people who come to our office and sort of make these requests. And we don't hear these requests coming from other federal agencies. We don't hear these requests coming from the broader academy. And I think, so, so that's a self-perpetuating problem then, is that they're not, they're, the, the academy isn't saying to them, this is a really important subject. It doesn't get included in data. And then if you want to do research, you go to the data and you don't have, I can't tell you how many times <laughs> students, I get calls from students who come up with these, you know, what they think are these brilliant ideas, you know, for research. And, and they say, you know, where could I get data for this? And like, it just, it, you know, it doesn't exist. Um, and, and so they, they tend to be very, you know, it's a, it's a very kind of frustrating process. And so I think that, that one of the ways that, that we can move this forward is, and, and, and I should say, by the way, that I think we have begun to see progress in changing this. And one of the ways I've seen progress is that if I were to show you some reviews of either grant proposals or uh, papers that I've submitted in peer-reviewed journals from 10 years ago, 
the reviews I would get were, were just shocking. I mean, they were flat out homophobic in the way they would review the work. There was not a scholarly review. They would make kind of really cheap shots. Um, that, and that's, I'm, I've been really impressed at the last couple grants or proposals that I've submitted that the reviews have actually been helpful. They've come back and thoughtful critiques and, and they've not been, so, so there's clear progress. I think um, another sort of source of, of challenge here is that because of this kind of internal system, the incentives for what kind of issues you respond to in the academy tend to be issues of kind of scholarly debate as opposed to public debate. And, and so the, there's, there's a lot of kind of internal theoretical scholarly debate that goes on around marriage and families that you know certainly informs policy debates. But the truth is that despite this enormous debate about marriage and what marriage means for same-sex couples, largely the academic community has been relatively silent. In, or at minimum kind of agnostic on, on informing that debate. And part of that is because there's no particular incentive for academics to go public with their views on this or to be vocal. And in fact, the incentives, in some, as I said, are, are somewhat um, against them. In a tenure review process, you know, getting your name in the New York Times in lots of disciplines actually is not very useful at all. Um, so becoming a kind of public figure, and, and in some cases can be um, harmful to you. And so I think all of those things sort of create um, uh, uh, this, this, again, this kind of vicious cycle where it's, it's really diffi difficult to both get better data and then to cultivate students who would use those data. Um, to do new and, and interesting work around LGBT people. So, you know, what do I think is, is uh, are some of the solutions? Well, you know, I'm really excited to see people like, for instance, uh, Wendy in her center. Um, Wendy and I participated um, probably eight or nine years ago in a big NIH effort called Counting Couples. And um, it was about how do you count uh, couples and how do you study couples and, and all of that. And um, you know, I, at both sessions, I looked at my watch and waited to see how long it took in the conference till someone acknowledged that a couple was anything but heterosexual. And in the first day, it was six hours. Um, <laughs> and the second go around was right in the midst of the kind of marriage debates. And uh, it was right around when Massachusetts was about to, uh, or I think had, um, the ruling had come down in Massachusetts. And again, I was struck by that I was like a, in a room full of the most prominent marriage scholars in the country, and very few of them had weighed in in any capacity. And, but that's really changed. So now, if you go to Wendy's, um, and Wendy has one of the, the big population centers around marriage and family in the country, and if you go to her website now, you see same-sex couple data integrated into all of the, and it's, it, that's the beginning of how we, I think, begin to change this. That when scholars see data on couples, they don't just see different sex couples. They see both same sex and different sex couples. Um, and you know, and, and I think we need to take it a step further and move towards LGBT. But you know, I do think it will take just a couple pioneers within that that domain to really begin to expose these data, the data that we have, which then helps us make the argument for more data. Um, and I think that's that's really the way that we can begin change because, again, students have to have their you know. They not only need the support of the topic area, but they really do oftentimes have to be able to, to have, especially in, in kind of quantitative disciplines where you use a lot of secondary data, where it's not as common to collect your own data. If you don't have that secondary data, it's just, it's, uh, it can really be a challenge. So, um, you know, so, so I guess my, my sort of s solution is, is people like Andy and Wendy who are willing to 
um, be out there, or and, and Mignon within sociology, pushing the boundaries around race and ethnicity, all of that kind of thing, I think, then <laughs> sets, and, and they publish in, in you know, their, their big journals within their disciplines. I think that's the way that we can start to, to move this along, and it, it becomes much easier to cultivate students. And the last thing I'll say about student cultivation is I'm also excited that, you know, one of the first suggestions I had to Brad here was that we do an empirical training for students who are interested in doing uh, LGBT work to kind of talk about what are the data that are there and, and how you appropriately use those data. And, you know, we had this amazing demand um, uh, five, five years ago or so when we started that. And what's exciting now is that, you know, there's now three or four places where students can do, go. Um, I don't know if Amy's here from the, the Fenway Health. They now have a program training students in LGBT empirical work. Uh, we didn't do ours this year uh, for a, a variety of reasons, but, you know, we still continue to, to do that process. So I think, again, there's, there, there, is, there are clear signs of hope in this regard, and I'm excited about the, the future prospects. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gary and Anne. All right. I'm going to move over here. Okay. Well, I'm really delighted to be here and very happy that Gary talked about students because that would have been at the top of my list of concerns about uh, our future. And I would add that one of the other things that Williams does is to have small research grant programs that are open to graduate students. And I've had students who benefited from that, and I'm really grateful uh, for that support. What I wanted to talk today about was to briefly try to give you an overview of what psychologists uh, who study couples have had to say that's been of use uh, in policymaking and in court decisions. And I think there are fundamentally two things that our research has done. First, I think scientific research has helped to dismantle old models that equated same-sex intimacy with deviance and deficiency. Um, to provide a little bit of background, uh, we heard yesterday, we were reminded that some of the early important research on uh, sexual orientation was done here at UCLA by Evelyn Hooker. She demonstrated that sexual orientation is not a mental disorder. What Hooker did was to study gay men drawn from the community, not from psychiatrist couches, uh, and she was able to demonstrate that these men were indistinguishable psychologically from uh, their heterosexual peers. Research on same-sex relationships has essentially asked analogous questions about the psychological well-being and functioning, not of individuals, but of couples. The goal has been to test prevailing negative stereotypes, uh, which Jenny was mentioning a little bit about. For instance, the belief that couples are typically, same-sex couples are typically unhappy, dysfunctional, uh, prone to jealousy, and short-lived. Scientific research has repeatedly debunked all of these stereotypes. What we found is that despite uh, social prejudice and stigma, that same-sex couples are often successful in establishing rewarding intimate relationships. <clears throat> Systematic research comparing same-sex couples <clears throat> and heterosexual couples clearly demonstrates that gay and lesbian relationships can be just as satisfying and just as long-lasting as can heterosexual relationships. These studies have used diverse samples and a variety of standardized measures of relationship functioning and have repeatedly come to the same conclusion. And this uh, repeated confirmation of the same finding has been particularly important. Now, of course, this is not to say that all same-sex couples are deliriously happy <laughs> and conflict-free, but rather that on average they do as well as their heterosexual counterparts. Um, a second contribution of psychological research has been to demonstrate that the same processes or mechanisms affect the quality and the stability of same-sex couples as uh, are relevant for heterosexual couples. Let me give a few examples. Intimate relationships benefit when partners have social support from their family, friends, neighbors, and others. And this is equally true for same-sex couples and for different-sex couples. 
Uh, as another example, regardless of sexual orientation, couples are happier when they have fewer arguments and when they're able to resolve those arguments successfully. To give another example, researchers have developed uh, models of the factors that increase commitment to a relationship and therefore lead to long-lasting relationships. Research shows, for example, that commitment tends to be high when relationship partners are happy in their relationship, when they've invested time and resources in the relationship, when they feel a sense of moral obligation, <coughs> and when they perceive important barriers or costs to getting out of the relationship. And this is true regardless of sexual orientation. Recent studies have not only asked uh, partners in same-sex couples uh, questions on uh, paper and pencil measures or in interviews, but have gone beyond that to actually observe same-sex couples interacting in the laboratory, uh, working together to try to solve a problem in their relationship, or uh, having a discussion to try to help one of the partners with a personal problem. And what the work shows is that same-sex couples and different sex couples approach these interactions very similarly. So in short, research has highlighted commonalities across couples regardless of sexual orientation. How has this been useful? Well, I think there are, uh, I want to just have time to mention two areas where uh, I think this has had a huge impact. One is that professional organizations, such as the American Psychological Association, have used empirical scientific findings to adopt policy statements about marriage and sexual orientation. Charlotte Patterson, who's here, and I and others run a task force in the APA addressing these issues. And on the basis of a review of the research evidence, the American Psychological Association passed a resolution that stated, in part, the APA believes that it is unfair and discriminatory to deny same-sex couples legal access to civil marriage. I think the importance of these consensus statements by professional organizations like the APA or the sociologists or the anthropologists should not be underestimated. They're cited in court cases and amicus briefs and so on. Um, in legal cases involving not only marriage equity but also adoption by gay parents, research on couples has been important. Um, I have had the opportunity to serve as an expert witness in two gay adoption cases, one in Florida and more recently uh, the case that was just successful in Arkansas. And in both these cases, what attorneys were interested in was not only demonstrating that kids do fine in uh, couples, in families headed by uh, gay or lesbian parents, but also that same-sex relationships are of high quality and can be enduring and stable and therefore are good homes for children. In the Prop 8 case, obviously, uh, research uh, showing that uh, there were so many commonalities between same-sex and different-sex couples was uh, terribly important, um, in part because it suggests that denying access to civil marriage inflicts great harm on same-sex couples. So where do we go from here? Uh, many fruitful lines of research, and I want to just highlight one area where I would put my money if I had it. <laughs> um, and that is the value of studying married same-sex couples in those states that permit marriage. Let me explain why I think that's such an important area for research. Um, I hope I've convinced you that research comparing same-sex couples and different sex couples can be very valuable, particularly in policy and legal arenas. This research is strengthened <clears throat> when both same-sex couples and heterosexual couples are similarly situated in society. And that has not been the case in past research. For example, research comparing same-sex couples in civil unions to heterosexual couples who are married um, is really confounding sexual orientation with the form of legal recognition that the couple has. Uh, similarly, even studies comparing, say, <coughs> excuse me, cohabiting same-sex couples to cohabiting heterosexual unmarried couples is really not comparable because in every state those cohabiting heterosexuals could be married if they had chosen to be. 
So it is really only in uh, places where marriage is an option for same-sex couples that we really can be uh, comparing similarly situated couples. If we were able to do that, I would propose doing longitudinal research. Uh, comparing couples from the time of marriage, or better yet, from even earlier in the process where they're thinking about marriage. And here are some of the things I would want to find out. Um, advocates for marriage equality have repeatedly emphasized that same-sex couples would benefit, not just economically, but psychologically, from uh, being able to marry. But that point has never been documented empirically. So I would ask questions like these. Does marriage lead to enhanced social support and acceptance from family, coworkers, and others? Does marriage strengthen partners' feelings of security about the future of their relationship? Does marriage lead same-sex couples to invest more in their relationships by making joint purchases, owning property together, and so on? Does marriage lead to an increase in personal well-being? Do married partners feel greater responsibility to take care of each other? Uh, and so do they, for instance, take a greater interest in promoting each other's health or reducing risky behaviors? Uh, and finally, does marriage lead to an overall reduction in the level of stress? Or since married couples may be more visible than couples who are not married, uh, does marriage actually uh, promote uh, greater experiences of minority uh, stress and discrimination. Uh, in looking at these differences, my one caveat would be to pay attention to gender, because I haven't had time to talk about the differences we've found between same-sex and uh, different sex couples, but they tend to focus on gender, division of labor, sexual exclusivity, and I think studies of marriage would need to take those into consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, very much. Um, Mignon. Now, I have to tell you that I just got tenure, so I'm pretty happy these days. <laughs> I'm a, a sociology. I teach in sociology and African American studies here at UCLA. And uh, uh, I have three projects that involve the intersections of race and sexuality. So rather than compare people across race or gender categories, all of my work, this recent work over the past uh, five to seven years, has examined in different ways these intersections. Uh, and so my first is my book project, uh, which will is forthcoming this summer, Invisible Families, Gay Identities, Relationships, and Mother among uh, black women and that's been uh, going to be published by University of California Press and it's a study of family formation among uh, women who are African-American who identify as lesbian by uh, lesbian bisexual gay in the life uh, women loving women it's a three-year mixed method study of uh, women uh, in New York and it examines how initial self-understandings based on race influence uh, the practice of sexuality. So it influences uh, the ways they think about their sexuality, the processes of union formation, the different routes that they take to motherhood, and the enactment of gendered power relations in their relationships. I've, I've worked on this for quite some time, and I'm very excited uh, to be talking about these issues. There aren't very many studies of family, uh, family formation and family process that com that look uh, at, at non-whites, I, I just have to say, and also that look at uh, working class uh, couples. So half of the women in my sample are working class and half are middle class. The second um, research uh, project that I have that's relevant for today looks at uh, characteristics of LGBT protest when they take place in black community contexts. So this specific project is part of a broader interest that I have in examining the relationships that racial minority lesbians and gay men have with their racial and ethnic and religious communities. And so in my work I show how uh, LGBT protest takes a particular form when individuals are also trying to maintain solidarity with, in this case, the racial group, despite the threat of distancing that occurs as a result of their sexual minority status. So I'm thinking about the integration of multiple identities, right, there, uh, the, to create a more complete and whole experience as LGBT people. 
Now, there's an important cohort effect that I found here. There are generational differences in how to understand sexuality as an identity status that exists alongside of race, which, because of the history of race in the U.S., has for older generations been a particularly salient feature of their personal identification, as well as the status around which they create these, create these group boundaries. So you see differences as you uh, look at uh, younger generations in how they understand race and sexuality as uh, identity statuses rather than just race as an identity status and sexuality as a behavior that they participate in. And the third project that I have is a new study. It's funded by the NIH, and I'm very excited about that because in the past they've not been so uh, eager to fund research on LGBT populations. Uh, that, that project is titled In the Shadow of Sexuality, Social Histories, Social Support, and Health Experiences of African American Older, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender uh, Women and Men. And this is a, a two-city study in Los Angeles and New York, and I'm looking at the social history, so people who came of age in the 1960s and 1970s in the context of the different social movements of that time. And I want to understand how they thought about race and gender and sexual, sexual behavior. So did they think of these things as identity statuses or, or were some of these things just uh, behaviors that they, that they uh, engaged in? And then I'm interested in their health and social support as they age. So how, how does race and sexuality and other statuses influence uh, their futures and how they think about their retirement futures. And so that work is being supported by the Center for the Health Improvement of Minority Elderly here at the UCLA School of Medicine. Now, in terms of same-sex marriage in particular, the most recent representation of the gay rights movement for sec uh, racial and ethnic minority groups has been this large discussion, you know, this ongoing discussion of same-sex marriage. So, of course, there are other movements that uh, other other things going on in the movement that are important. This issue has had a particular resonance for racial and ethnic populations because there have been these national public debates, right, and these have brought the topic of gay sexuality directly into homes and into church pulpits, and they force this kind of uh, uh, public discussion. And so this has provided a vehicle by which black and Latina and Asian or Pacific Islander and other ethnic groups, uh, you know, I can think of uh, my Irish lesbian friends and my Italian friends back home. I grew up in a, <laughs> I grew up in a white uh, work, lower middle class neighborhood in Long Island, so I have all these different friends. Um, that I've kept in contact with, but it's it's been a way for uh, for these people who have a strong racial and ethnic identity to develop a conversation about gay sexuality with family members and with others in their ethnic communities, and it's really uh, done something important for these groups by moving this uh, gay sexuality from the private sphere as uh, behavior that individuals carried out in kind of an open secret where people knew, but we just didn't talk about it over dinner. You'd bring a partner for Thanksgiving, and no one would ever mention this as a partner, it would be thought of as a friend. It's moved that to a public openness about who we are as African American or Mexican or Korean people who also have same-sex partners. And so these relationships that were once uh, invisible are now being uh, exposed and celebrated as a result of these discussions of same-sex marriage as people are more open in their unions and raising families together. So even though you have these uh, sometimes ethnic or religious differences in, in um, the when you look at uh, voting behavior, right, in terms of acceptability, it is having this impact of moving this debate forward and and and, po and allowing uh, for a voice, a voice to be heard uh, for these racial and ethnic lesbians and gay men. And to use the, the language of political scientist Kathy Cohen, this has become a cross-cutting issue that threatens the perceived unity and the shared identity of group members. But through younger cohorts who are, who are, as I mentioned earlier, talking about how to integrate these identities, we're seeing this uh, move forward. We're seeing which arguments are persuasive, right, for grandma and, and uncle. LG, I have an uncle LG, <laughs> which arguments are persuasive and which aren't, you know, which arguments the larger uh, LGBT community might think of as persuasive but aren't so persuasive to uh, Aunt Lila and Uncle LG. 
And then for African American groups in particular, same sex marriage is relevant uh, for their experience because it serves as a physical response to the stigma that's often associated with the wider range of family structure among blacks. So stereotypes of black men who fail to hold up to their responsibilities as fathers or partners, and also stereotypes of black women as sexually permissive, who immorally choose single motherhood over the stability of a marital union. So you have weddings and same-sex marriage through weddings in black communities, which symbolize the attempt of the couple to conform to these notions of black respectability and also to show to the world that blacks as a group can assimilate, assimilate into socially acceptable patterns of behavior. So some black gays who want to marry want to show to families, family members and members in the racial group uh, that they defy these negative stereotypes of black people and these negative stereotypes of gay people and that they can create and sustain stable families. So in this sense, you might think of gay marriage as a conventional or some might even say conformist presentation of self, right, and antithesis to images of gay counterculture. But I argue be that because of the racialized context in which same-sex marriage is taking place for African Americans and for other groups, I haven't studied other groups in this way, but I argue that is it, ex it is experienced by those in the community as a radical and transformative act. So others in the community who are seeing this, right, which uh, from, for some uh, LGBT activists, it seems assimilationist and, and conformist, but when it takes place in these contexts, I uh, try to show the way it, it's transformative and the way people view it as, as radical. And so I encourage others who are interested in these issues to consider how differences in social context relate to how same-sex marriage and other gay rights legislation more generally is experienced and understood. So I'm glad I got through my my <laughs> 10 minutes before she did this. <laughs> right, right on time. Right on time. Uh, Wendy, will okay. you speak from the table I'm or the podium? I'm going here because I have a lot of notes and I need space. <laughs> and then this way, Gary can can uh, nudge me say something wrong. So I'm here, um, I, I'm really honored to be here and I, I thank you for the invitation. And um, I'm here as someone who probably comes from a little bit of a lens outside of the Williams Institute. And I'm currently the co-director of the National Center for Family and Marriage Research. And our goals are really to um, support research on families and well-being, the, the well-being of children, youth, and families looking um, Mainly, we're there to help provide new data resources to the research community. And we produce national profiles, and we have um, reviews of new data that are coming out. We have uh, question and measure snapshots. And we're organizing the update to this uh, infamous uh, conference, <laughs> Counting Couples, um, Counting Families. And uh, I clearly resonate with some of the messages yesterday about from the IOM report about needing new, new data and the demands um, for building a data infrastructure. And I would argue more broadly that um, there's a large support just for new data on families and updated data, nationally representative data about family and family life. And, um, and I think that's uh, one reason why there's a, um, a, a lot of general push to just collect Get, get the best data possible so we can make informed decisions for families and um, policy. And my own work has really focused on uh, relationships outside the boundaries of marriage and a lot of work on cohabitation among different sex couples, as well as research on sexual relationships and non-resident parenting. And I think one of the themes of my work has been that everything's complicated. And if someone wanted to make fun of me, they could say, you're just saying everything's complicated, nothing's easy. And so that'll probably be the underlying message um, today. So that's the short, the short answer. Um, uh, and, and really, um, one of my themes also is to think carefully about our comparison groups. And I think that was already brought up by, by Anne. And one of my early themes was we can't always compare how children are faring in different family types compared to two biological married parent families. And um, w actually, we know now that less than half of children in the United States live in what we consider a traditional two biological married parent family. That is a family that has no stepchildren and just two biological married, and this would be at this time, um, uh, different sex parents. 
and their um, children and, and their biological children with no stepkids. So that's really not really the normative family anymore. And so we need to think more more broadly and maybe even someday. And I even sensed this a little bit yesterday um, in some of the comments uh, about that maybe the um, uh, gay and lesbian couples who are seeking marriage might be in some ways the most advantaged or privileged individuals. And um, there seems to be some divide between those who are seeking um, uh, relationship, what was the, there was a term that I thought was really interesting, relationship recognition work. And I, I would argue that that, and that that work is really important because it has a very serious implications for children and adults' well-being. And so it's not just sort of a luxury good to get, to get married and that we really want to think about this, um, this more broadly. And that I think, um, you know, someday we might be talking about privileged children who are with two, two, bio, two, two married parents, two married parents, and they might be biological or not, and they could be same same sex or different sex parents, and so that might become our, our, our comparison group. And so we just want to be, be careful about probably not creating some of these divides. Um, but one of the things I wanted to discuss was really some work about that the family is not an objective um, social fact. And so in a lot of research, and I've, I've heard it a little bit today, that we sort of treat it as, a, as very clearly defined. The lines around families might be very clear, but at the same time, we all know, we can all envision in our heads that this is, these are really subjective views and that this is really um, something the family literature has had to contend with. And so you might think it might be new in terms of thinking about um, gay or lesbian families, but in fact, it's been something that's been very common in, um, tr in traditional research on families. And so, um, when I started doing my research and started focusing on different sex, unmarried couples, that was really innovative and crazy. And uh, so I'm just saying that this is, <laughs> um, this is there, there's a lot of lessons I think to be learned from, from, this, from this literature and these experiences. And I hope the pace is faster than it's been, um, been historically. Um, and, and, def and we all know that defining families is really important in terms of responsibilities about end of life, medical proxies, family benefits, alimony, assets, um, other kinds of assets. And these subjective assessments are really meaningful. And I wanted to point to you actually Brian Powell's new book called um, um, Count It Out. And I'm um, excited to say that the um, National Center for Family and Marriage Research uh, helped fund his most recent data collection. And so just to give you a little couple tidbits from his results, um, he, he was looking at what, how do Americans define families, and he's saying that two-thirds of Americans include some type of same-sex couple in their definition of a family, and that's a change from 45% in 2003. So there's been a large shift in how we think and conceptualize families, and I just think that's important that we have maybe a larger endorsement of this idea and that we know that public opinion matters. We've seen that in a lot of states. Um, and he's also claimed just because there's a lot of support for something doesn't mean that there's not opposition. But he also finds that there's less opposition to um, same-sex uh, families. And that's declined from about 59% in 2003 to 48% in 2010. And so he argues, really, the, there's more people supporting than opposing same-sex families. And he sees that um, in a very optimistic uh, lens. And he sees that. Um, um, many Americans really are in favor of some form of recognition of same uh, of same sex families, and I think um, he 's really highlighting some of the boundaries between family and non family what is a family what 's not a family and my own work has showcased some of that in terms of thinking about family ambiguity so not only how does public opinion think of families but how do family members themselves define their family and that 's something that i 've focused on and Andy was one of the leaders along with um, uh, Frank Furstenberg and looking at remarriage and, and how people defined their families who were in remarried families. And so this has been extended in thinking about um, folks in cohabiting parent families. And if you're not living with, if you're living with a cohabiting, with your mother and her cohabiting partner, for example, then that's a cohabiting step family. And how do people think, how do people talk and think about their family members? And so we asked um, adolescents and we asked mothers who's in your family, and there was a, a high level of um, incongruity in their reports. And some people might argue that's error, but I don't think it's really error. It just means that people are thinking about their families differently, and it really depends on whose perspective you take. So we found that for about 11% of um, 
of adolescents and mothers, there was some discord in their reporting of who's in their family. And if you can't even agree about who's in your family, it's really challenging um, to think about um, all kinds of uh, parenting processes and family processes. And we know that family functioning really um, varies according to some of these indicators of, um, of ambigu ambiguity in families. So I wanted to um, make sure I got that point in. Um, and just the idea that we socially construct families and it's sort of a moving target. And so while I applaud and I'm clearly um, one of the number one fans of getting new data, we have to be really careful about this. We can't just sort of um, be like a bull in a china shop and just march in and say this is how, uh, how we're going to do it. And to think um, about why there are similarities and differences. So uh, there was a lot of talk yesterday about significant differences in families, statistically significant. And I think we all kind of want to think we are from Lake Wobegon, maybe where the women are strong, the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. And these statistical differences are really important to us. But you have to remember that not just everybody in um, two biological married different sex couples are faring fabulously. And not every child who's in a single mother family is, is, getting, is failing out of school. And so when you observe these significant differences, I would caution us to not jump to broad conclusions. And I think that's what the family researchers um, are, 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 might make us a little nervous actually about weighing in on some of these debates. And that while there's statistical differences, we might not think that they're quite as um, they, they might not define the boundaries of the debate as clearly as, 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 we, might, um, as we might like. I'm going to get a time flash here in a moment. Um, so I used to think that Gary Gates had a really easy job because everywhere I would go, he would just say this point about nobody's studying same-sex families and he's got this thing. And I thought, wow, he's getting paid a lot of money to just do that, you know? And I wish, I wish that were my job. Mine's more complicated and I have to sort of contend with the complexity of families and I can't even imagine, I can't, I'm not, I'm struggling to study um, different sex parent families, and I'm not even sure the challenges that come when you want to study LBGT families. That adds a whole other layer, and I can't, I can't get my head around how to group people together or separate them. And um, so I think the good news is that his job has become more challenging, that, <laughs> that he can no longer do that anymore, and that we as a community, I think, have, have, um, have shown that. But I think there's also challenging news, and that we really need to try to integrate these fields and learn a lot from each other. And I think there's a lot, there's a lot to be gained, um, gained from that. And I think this is an important first step forward. Thank you, Wendy and Andy. Thank you. I was not here yesterday. So let me take this opportunity to congratulate the Williams Institute on its 10th anniversary and for all it has done for those of us uh, in social science. It's been a great institute, continues to be. And in particular, I would li like to express my appreciation as a demographer to Gary Gates. <laughs> what he has done over the last 10 years for the demographic study of LGBT family and personal life has been uh, instrumental. Um, it has been uh, the best and most important work, and we've all benefited from it. So maybe his job is getting a little tougher. That's fine. <laughs> But he's been very good at what he's doing, and on behalf of the demographic community, I'd like to express our appreciation for all that he has done. It's also a pleasure to be back at UCLA, where I got my PhD um, many, many hundreds of years ago, um, and uh, it's nice to be back. Um, Gary mentioned that one of the keys to, uh, to making the study of LGBT family and personal life, uh, a larger part of social science is to integrate it with other things. And I think that's what, what's going to happen. I think the study of these particular issues will become more integrated. Um, you know, there are two reasons to study um, LGBT families uh, and the personal life of the individuals in those families. One is to understand them better. It's very important. We want to do that. But the second is to try to understand what the experiences of those individuals and families tell us about the future of the family in the United States. There's a lot that they can tell us, and I think there are opportunities now to learn more than we have been able to learn in the past. There are opportunities for one thing because the data is better, 
uh, in part because of the efforts of Gary and, and Wendy and others. We do have more data. Uh, in large part, they're, they're better because in a number of jurisdictions, uh, same-sex marriage is now legal. Now, I don't mean to diminish the, the need for continuing work on that front, many of the best of it done by people in this room. And uh, certainly, I come from a state where same-sex marriage failed by just one or two votes in one of the houses this year, but much closer than ever. Nevertheless, there, is, there are now several jurisdictions, and I'm confident will be several more jurisdictions uh, in the near future in which um, people can enter into same-sex marriages. Uh, and that's very important. In addition, there are changing attitudes. Um, as Wendy mentioned, a survey in Indiana done by Brian Powell shows changing attitudes. The Pew Center came up, with, came up with some interesting data a few months ago. They asked people in a national survey, um, they were asked whether they thought each of several family trends were, quote, generally a good thing for our society, a bad thing for our society, or doesn't make much difference, end quote. Then they were given several different kinds of families. And what was notable was that a majority of Americans were either positive or neutral toward a whole set of these kinds of families, not just the traditional family. And most notable was the fact that a majority, 53%, were either positive or neutral about, quote, more gay and lesbian couples having children, unquote, as against 43% who are negative. So we have a moment when there is much greater acceptance, acceptance nationwide about a, a whole uh, a host of different kinds of families uh, rather than just the traditional family. And I think that makes this research more timely, uh, uh, more popular. Um, and I do think that in social science, at least in sociology, the days are over when studying these issues was somehow difficult or a disadvantage. At least I would like to think so, at least at Johns Hopkins University. <laughs> uh, so why is this a, an issue? Why, why do I think this is an opportunity? Um, well, um, Anne has told us why it's important to study same-sex marriage. and. I certainly endorse and agree with that. But let me talk about why it's important to study some new things emerging among LGBT families and individuals beyond same-sex marriage, such as studying cohabiting couples, cohabiting couples with children. Until recently, and, and now even, even now in about 45 states, gay and lesbian couples who are cohabiting were composed of two different types. Those who would have married if they could and those who would not choose to marry if they could. They were both there. And therefore, it was hard to really distinguish the two of them and hard, start, hard to study um, what, um, what, it's hard to study what they might be uh, up to. Um, now, as marriage becomes accepted and legal in some jurisdictions, it will be of interest to study the people who choose not to marry. And there will be many who will choose not to marry. Um, and they will be making a more or less free choice. Uh, I don't, and using words like free, I don't mean to suggest there's no more prejudice against LGBT individuals. Of course there is. But you know, relatively speaking, they were making a, a un, more unconstrained choice about what to do. And they can tell us a bit then about how um, cohabitation plays a role and what role it does play in families in this country um, in ways that uh, control for gender in, in the social science parlance. Um, and which can be of great use. And there are a number of interesting issues. Uh, one issue is how much new law the law community should impose upon cohabiting couples, both heterosexual and, and same sex. Um, the uh, argument for lots of law is that you want to protect kids in those families. The argument against lots of law is that many people choose to cohabit rather than marry just to get away from some of the laws that are in marriage. In France, for example, there is the Civil Social so Civil Solidarity Pact, which when debated by, by the French, um, was debated on these terms. Many people said that they didn't want to have a whole set of legal regulations regulating this new civil union form, because the point was not to be married. Um, so we will see a little bit about this. I went to a conference at uh, Columbia Law School a couple of months ago, organized by Elizabeth Scott, um, hoping to hear what the, uh, the, the scholarly uh, legal community uh, had in the way of answers to all these questions. And it turns out they have no idea, <laughs> <laughs> and neither do I. And we need to come up with answers that will be answers about cohabiting couples, both heterosexual and same-sex, OK? The, the answers and the questions will be very similar. 
Um, there will be good reasons to study both. I think that the study of LGBT families will be folded in to the study of, uh, of the larger issues. Um, then there are the people who choose alternative arrangements, neither cohabiting in the conventional sense nor marriage. Um, we have seen in studies of, uh, of uh, gay and lesbian families in the past a lot of innovative behavior on the part of people who had to work very hard to construct families in the ways that they could through networks of friends and wherever family members they could tag along. It was admirable, it was innovative, but here again it was somewhat of a constrained choice. I mean, you had to do this. Um, now, as there are other opportunities, the people who will still choose those kinds of alternatives are more or less freely choosing them. And one will be able to see how many choose that, what these arrangements look like, whether they tend to change from what they've looked like in the past. And that, that um, uh, enterprise will really tell us a bit more about whether families as we think of them have a future in the U.S. and to what extent we are seeing the emergence of forms of personal life and personal communities that are some sense transcending all of the bounds of family that we've been talking about, uh, say, this morning in this seminar. Um, once we have people making unconstrained choices for chosen families, as they're called, um, within the LGBT community, then I think we will have a very interesting group to tell us what this is all about. So I look forward to studies of these kinds of issues of many different kinds of LGBT family and personal life arrangements, because I think not only will they help us understand those individuals better, but they'll help us understand more about the future of marriage, family, and personal life in this country at a moment when there's lots of, of, uh, of change going on. And finally, as marriage becomes legal and as we have alternatives, I will be very interested to see if social class differences begin to emerge uh, among uh, LGBT families. Uh, one of the sharpest trends over the last decade or two in the demography of the family has been the, the sharp divergence of the fates of people with college degrees uh, and people without. Married couples in which the, the, the spouses have college degrees have done better. Their divorce rates have been going down. Um, they're doing at least treading water financially. Married couples in which nobody has a college degree are not doing well at all. And with those with the least uh, education are doing even worse. I think that's because of the globalization and automation of production, which has made it difficult for people to have, without college degrees, to have the kind of jobs that are still thought to be the foundation for a marriage by almost everybody in this country. Certainly Mignon's work begins to get us there, and it's very important, but there's not been a lot of it. Globalization and automation have happened to LGBT individuals too. What do those trends mean? Will we see a splitting, a, a, a divergence of marriage and family life along these same lines, along lines which suggest that for those people who cannot find the kinds of jobs that they would ordinarily like to have, uh, which suggests that they, they may behave differently. And if we don't see a split, a class split in the LGBT community, that itself would be fantastically interesting data. So here again, I think we have the opportunity to study a group and understand them better, but to study them in the context of, of understanding the entire evolution of marriage and family and personal life in the U.S. today. Thank you very much.